why did you decided to take over Ingress? Yeah, so uh, maybe just to give you uh, some background on our fund, because our fund is very much uh, targeted at situations like Ingress. So uh, my partner, David Helfridge, and I both were, you know, in operating jobs in companies here in the Valley, each for about 16 years. Uh, David in the networking arena, he was one of the co-founders of Ascend Communication and Copper Mountain and uh, was at Motorola for many years. And then conversely, I was on the software side and uh, started my career at Tandem uh, and then you know spent 90 to 94 working for Larry Ellison at Oracle. Um, so the database arena is one that I know fairly well. And uh, um, so two years ago, a little over two years ago, David and I started a fund a uh, $350 million fund, half the capital comes from Harvard and Stanford's endowments. And the purpose of the fund was to do a handful of investments where we would partner with large corporations that we envisioned had underperforming assets. And when I say partner, you know, our plan would be that they would keep a minority interest in the company as we spun it out and built it up. And so about 15, almost 18 months ago now, uh, I approached Computer Associates uh, with, a, with an idea to spin out uh, the Ingress business. And, uh, you know, what was really attractive for me with Ingress was it was a technology that had been out in the market for 20 to 25 years, very loyal customer base, was always thought of as a, as a very, very strong technology, but, you know, kind of lost the first round of the database wars against Oracle and Informix. And 10 years ago, CA had bought the company as part of uh, an, uh, an acquisition of Ask Systems, which was a public company. Um, and at the time, this was not a business that CA had for sale. And uh, Mark Berenshay, who was a former Oracle executive that I knew, was running all the development for CA. Uh, and Jeff Clark, who was their COO, was someone I had known in the past. Um, so, you know, we approach them as much as operating people, as finance people, to say, you know, this is a business we know extremely well. If you took it out of CA, here's what we would do with it. Um, prior to uh, that process, a year before, CA had actually put Ingress out into the open source community. Uh, they'd put it on the CA website, but they really hadn't marketed it per se as, a, as you know, an aggressive open source play. Uh, and for CA, they had over 1,200 products in their product line. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the key products for them are Unicenter for network management and eTrust for security. Um, but Ingress, in that sense, was a rather small product line revenue-wise compared to those big products. But one of the decisions Mark Berenshay had made when he came in four or five years ago from Oracle was to basically put Ingress underneath all those products within the CA product family. So Unicenter, billion and a half dollar product for CA, runs Ingress underneath as the data store. And so in that process, they wound up adding a lot of mission critical features and you know, really keeping the product current, uh, per se. So uh, what we agreed to do with, uh, with CA was they would keep a 20% position, Mark would be on the board, uh, we would create an option pool that we would give for employees to motivate them in this new company. And then Garnet and Helfridge put a significant amount of capital on the balance sheet uh, to buy the, the majority ownership position. Uh, and what came with this was uh, about 100 employees from Computer Associates. Uh, half of them were development people, half were support people. Uh, and what was remarkable is that uh, as of today, there are 10,000 active enterprise customers using Ingress on top of all the customers that are using Unicenter and are using it on an embedded basis. And paying licensing. And then paying licensing and, and all the rest. And several years ago as well, Computer Associates did a major deal with EDS and Computer Sciences Corporation, CSC, and resold the entire CA product family to those two companies to resell. So what we find also is there's several thousand EDS CSC customers that are running Ingress. So what was very attractive was that we could get a mission critical product that was really battle tested in very, very large customer environments. And we could take that with an open source strategy 
uh, into the market, which we think is you know, a new segment that's evolving that's going to be a very big part of the database industry going forward. With, with uh, IBM DB2, Oracle, Microsoft SQL, is there a need for another database, database product, enterprise product, yeah. or not even another database? Company? Very good question. So the database business, uh, I would describe as an oligopoly. There are those three players plus Sybase, so four major vendors, who split up a $16 billion a year license business and support business. Um, what's evolved over the years is that as this business segment has grown and those four players have, have really come to dominate, uh, the installed base and the customers that use the technology and partners uh, pay premium prices to those four vendors. And those businesses, those specific businesses for those four vendors are incredibly profitable, uh, which in many ways fuels uh, Oracle's ability to go spend $18 billion on applications, Microsoft's ability to lose money in the Xbox business, et cetera, is this is a major cash cow segment for those companies. Uh, and customers pay that price at the end of the day. Very little negotiating room. The business practices are, are very tight that you know customers almost on a take it or leave it basis have to use these products. And our view is we're the fifth player into this $16 billion business and we can be much more aggressive about pricing with our open source model, support, but have a product that's as good literally as DB2 or the high end of Oracle today. So it's a very, very unusual situation that you can show up with a product with 20 years of experience and completely change the pricing model. And I guess what I would say is, you know, who would have guessed five years ago that Red Hat would come into the market and be a serious threat to Microsoft and NT and Solaris? I mean, you know, the vision five years ago was that, you know, the, the operating system wars are over. You know, Microsoft won, IBM has a small footprint, Sun has a small footprint. But you have this extremely successful new, you know, movement with Linux, and and Red Hat is become successful at it. So, I mean, if you were to say my mission, I'd like to be the Red Hat of the database layer, uh, and 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 be that kind of enterprise solution for people. In terms of product itself, how how does the Ingress database compete with with uh, um, with the other other fours, either in terms of performance, in right. terms of uh, reliability, and uh, yeah. So, what you find if you look at the Ingress customer base, it's extremely large, uh, very successful companies. In fact, in, in, in France, I was just in Paris a month ago and I met with 12 major customers uh, that are using Ingress today, one of them being L'Oreal, who uses it extensively throughout all their manufacturing plants. So these are mission critical high-end applications that have been in place for, for many, many years, if not 10, 15, 20 years. So, I think it's a given that it's comparable. Now, what's interesting, during my time at Oracle, I actually launched Oracle 7, which was a very, very successful product for Oracle in 1992. Since then, they've announced Oracle 8, Oracle 9, and, and the most recent release is Oracle 10G. If you look at the install base of Oracle, which is billions of dollars, a third of the install base is still on the Oracle 7 release, which is 12 years old. And I would guess that the Ingress release, Ingress 2006, is probably somewhere between Oracle 9 and Oracle 10G. Now, Oracle 10G has been in the market about two years. Less than 5% of the customer base is upgraded to Oracle 10G. So if we can be a third to a half of the price of Oracle and be 80 to 90% of the functionality and performance, there's a vast amount of the customer base that will find that incredibly attractive. Uh, who haven't, over all these years, the last decade, upgraded because what they had was good enough. And, and I think that's an interesting phenomenon today. You see this with Microsoft, with Vista, is at some point, features actually are a negative. You know, too many features and bloatware and software, of, you know, adding so much that it slows the product down, customers stay on the old releases. And so, you know, we're going to be a technology leader, we're going to add a lot of continual features, but, you know, I think it's not about just having a couple new features and a new release and the market, you know, takes everything that you give them. 
but, but very often also it's not only about, as you mentioned, features and, mm -hmm. and, and even not performance, but it, a lot of things is, is, has to do with applications. Right. So when you have those customers who are still with Oracle 7 but have all the application on top mm -hmm. of that, how... Um, how do you migrate them? How do you migrate them? Is it difficult to the, for them to actually migrate from Oracle 7 to Ingress and make sure everything actually works? No, that's, uh, you know, part of the reason that the install bases have stayed with particular vendors is that th these are very sticky applications. Uh, and, and, and the vendors have realized this and they've raised prices accordingly because the customers, you know, are, are, are very reticent to say, yes, we're going to move it because of the costs and all the rest. I think you've got to be have an economic proposition that's significantly cheaper, but also better business practices. I think, you know, as I've talked to large vendors that use these products, not just Oracle, but SQL Server and DB2, and large customers, you know, there's been a real backlash about, you know, the, you know, thousand page contract, nothing is negotiable, it's a take it or leave it proposition. So I think one of our thrusts is not just price, but it's, you know, how easy are we to deal with? Um, and I can say in the last three or four months since we've done the spin out, I've talked to some extremely large customers that are very motivated to, 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 to make that migration. And it's not just the database layer, it's also whether or not they want to stay on you know, uh, Solaris or NT, they're looking to go to a lower cost uh, Red Hat or Linux solution. So there's several layers to the stack that they're looking to, 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 to uh, make this move with. And what you find is, you know, SQL is a very much a standard today. Uh, you know, if you write proprietary PL SQL from Oracle, then you probably are more locked in. But for a lot of applications that are used with standard SQL, there's a lot of tools from companies like Informatica and others that allow you to do that migration pretty rapidly. So um, you're absolutely right that the applications are a big part of this, um, but I think customers are sophisticated enough to tackle this. Because one thing I'm always amazed when I go to Oracle World is a number of third-party developers and, and so on. Did you have, or are you working? I'm sure you're working on, yeah. on attracting the third parties, the Informatica, the world, the, yeah. the BEA, you know. Absolutely. So, so how how far are you with with that uh, building yeah. a, a developer community? So so I think one of the interesting dynamics is in the software market right now is that you really have four centers of power. You have Oracle, SAP, IBM, and Microsoft. And increasingly, those four are sending signals to the market that they're going to do everything. Oracle has not just applications, they have application servers, uh, they have the database. They're talking about going into the operating system layer. Um, IBM, the same. You may see Microsoft and, and IBM go into the application business. So if you're one of the other players outside of those four, your BEA, Oracle has three application servers. Seventy percent of the BEA sales that go out, go out with Oracle. So if you're a partner of Oracle's in that case, BEA, shipping product, you kind of say and wonder, well, they have three of their own versions of this same product. That doesn't sound like a very compelling partnership for me. And then Oracle's rumored to buy JBoss in the open source business, which means a give it away strategy. So what we're finding is, and, and, and that's the same for Red Hat, is 80% uh, of Red Hat today goes out with Oracle. And it's partly because, you know, as Linux, Microsoft SQL Server doesn't run on it. it runs on NT, they're not gonna support Linux. DB2, you know, is much more fixed to AIX and their own platforms. So if you're Red Hat, you think long and hard about whether you wanna have 80% of your business tied to a future competitor. So I think what we've brought to the table is another choice. And so what we're finding is the key vendors going forward that I think build the market like these are saying maybe Ingress is a good alternative that we ought to have maybe as the second or the third database. Now, we probably won't be their number one choice in the immediate future, but all we need to be is number two or number three and go out and jointly sell with them. And we think the dynamics of that competition is gonna push them closer to us. Um, again, for us to be a very successful company, hundreds of millions of sales, we only need a few market share points out of the 16 billion. 
And, you know, I think this is a project that takes four or five years and a lot of investment on our part. But the good news is we have the technology that's competitive today and is a real alternative, which hasn't really existed. So the, the, other, the other issue is that as Linux is adopted in emerging countries, Brazil, China, India, all those new applications are going to be built on a new platform. And whether it's Linux with an open source database or open source tools, you know, we think that's going to be a whole new area of growth. Um, so we really don't have to steal revenue from the big vendors. There will be new organic growth and new, new applications written by all these companies. But you know, we absolutely are in the market trying to pull some of those key partners our direction. But, uh, but uh, again, the, the, the previous question was, well, do we need another d uh, database company? And then the next, I think, the natural... Uh, we need some of the existing ones to go away, right. which we're trying to do, too. It's not, this is not the first open source database company. So it, we have it, MySQL, for example. Uh, uh, Sun is pushing another open source database. How mm -hmm. now? So you, you're, you're, you're sort of in between, uh, between those big four and those open source databases yeah. that are very yeah. popular. Well, if you look at the existing, it, there are very, very high barriers to entry to enter the database business. Technically, to build a real mission critical database takes about 10 years. Probably takes four or five releases. You know, it took until Oracle 6 before Oracle really had a stable mainstream product, which was probably about 12 to 15 years after the company had started. So it's not something that a startup can sort of bring to market. You can bring simplistic versions of a product to do query processing and to kind of sit outside and, and do simple query requests, but not to run a major transactional company environment. So I think what you found is there are a handful of open source databases, but they've been used for very low-end applications, and they really don't compete with Oracle or DB2. MySQL, who you mentioned, uh, very interesting situation. Again, they've been used primarily for these kind of query applications. But I think the challenge they're going to have is their most recent... One of the things that's interesting about Ingress is we own all of our own technology. When we spun this out of Computer Associates, you know, we own the entire stack. When you look at something like MySQL, it's a series of components that were built by third parties that MySQL integrates and presents as a product to you. Well, two of the key components that were in their most recent release, MySQL 5.0, which was really their product that was going to take them into more of these mission-critical environments, are two components that Oracle has acquired, InnoDB and times 10. Times 10 for scalability and performance, and InnoDB for cursors and row-level locking and a lot of those advanced features. Well, now, if you take MySQL and you use it, for all intents and purposes, you're using an Oracle product. And so MySQL now has to negotiate a license with Oracle now that those have been bought. And this is very recent. This is in the last few months. They're going to have to get a license from Oracle to use that. The only alternative MySQL has is they have to fork the code base, and they've got to pull that code out, and they've got to rewrite it again, which this level of sophistication is probably another two- to year, three-year effort. So I think they've absolutely taken a step backwards competitively. But again, MySQL is, you know, 10, I mean, they're probably about 30 to 40 million in revenue relative to the 16 billion that gets spent. It's not really a question for customers of, you know, can Ingress beat MySQL? The real issue is can we dump the six or seven billion dollars that people give Oracle every year? Um, so I, I, would, I would argue that there's always room for competition if you're innovating. What's very unusual here is you have something that's as good as the very best in the, in the market, but it's going to be delivered at a significantly lower price point. And can you touch on that, on the pricing model? So the, the, the way the product is structured in a classic open source uh, approach is uh, it's a GPL license, so you can download the product, you can use it for development. Uh, if you build an application that is also going to be put into open source, you know, that's something you can go run with. If you're going to resell the application, then you work out a business relationship with Ingress and we sign a contract. Uh, we make our money based on support uh, on a per processor basis when it's deployed. Uh, we have a number of customers, the 10,000 are on a prior license model uh, and support model. So we have an existing 
revenue business and this is going to be a new leg to that with more revenue and and all the rest but it will be very much as you would describe a, a, a classic open source model I, I also think open source is going to evolve uh, what it is today I mean there are 500 different licensing schemes in the open source world um, you know that's going to change over time. It's a little bit. Which one are they? Oh, uh, uh, th th there are standard ones like GPL that a lot of the vendors go to, but Apple, Sun, you know, hardware companies have all their own licensing models. Um, there's a million splinter permutations, and so uh, you know, customers are a little bit frantic right now to figure out if I sign this license versus this license, what are the nuances, and is this going to come back to haunt me? And that's really why it's important that, in our case, we own our technology. So if we, if we license our technology to a major software ISV or to a customer, they know that no one's going to come back to them and claim, well, you used my code in an unauthorized way from some third party. So you know, we warrant and we'll certify and you know, prove the stack to that customer or ISV. So, um, that leads me to what we call business open source. So we think there's going to be an upper end part of the open source market that's going to evolve that is going to be really targeted at main, mainstream business applications. And we believe that um, we're looking for those sophisticated customers and integrators and contracting houses to actually be the ones that are going to author some of the additions to our product. So it's probably going to be less of individual renegade computer programmers giving us code that we put in. It's more going to be, you know, a major bank, uh, a major Accenture of the world, um, uh, integrator that's going to be a partner with us to kind of add features that maybe for certain vertical markets, for uh, certain, you know, custom applications. How big is Ingress today? What sort of revenues uh, are you, is, is the company generating? Is the company already profitable, despite the fact that you're, you're basically a yeah. company? Yeah. So when we spun the company out, we assumed the hundred, uh, the the ten thousand contracts from Computer Associates. Some of those were large scale contracts where customers had bought you know dozens or hundreds of products from CA. So going forward, those customers will renew their contracts with uh, computer with uh, Ingress. That revenue stream is somewhere on the order of fifty to one hundred million dollars a year, uh, depending on um, you know going back to the customer and assessing how much product they have, where they're using it. You know the minimum of that's going to be about fifty, but it probably could be close to one hundred million a year. We spun the company out with one hundred employees. Four months into it, we now have about one hundred and sixty around the world. Uh, we're planning to be up at around 200 people by summer. Um, so we're very much in an investment mode. So our sense is that you know, for this year, we, we'll probably lose money. Going into next year, we think we'll be cash flow positive. And, uh, um, but that's partly more fact of the fact that we really want to invest at this point. Can you, can you tell us what sort of difference uh, do you make between being cash flow positive and being profitable? So when you're cash flow positive, it takes into account, uh, you know, capital expenditures, you know, other line, line items versus, you know, how much gap recognizable revenue you have. And so, you know, typically you differentiate between, you know, is your cash balance on a cash basis as you run the company going up or down, or from an accounting perspective as you would report numbers and profitability. Those are typically different numbers for any company. Um, you know, the first goal, and which is much more immediate, is cash flow positive, where you're actually generating cash, and then the second one is actual profitability. What's your strategy in, in terms of international markets? Uh, you have customers in, in, in around the world, L'Oréal in France. Right. Do you have people on the ground? Are you collaborating with CA? Yeah. Or is it yeah, that's a very good question. Completely different? So we actually have customers in 58 countries around the world, day one. Uh, more than half of our business is in Europe. So I would say about 30 to 35 percent of our business is in the Americas, uh, and the balance, 10 percent or so, is in Asia. So Europe is extremely important to us. When we inherited the 100 people from CA, half the employees were in Europe. 
a large group uh, and a development center in the UK. We have a support center in uh, Paris and one in Frankfurt. Uh, we're now expanding into the Eastern Bloc. Uh, we have a number of distributors in the Middle East. Uh, so it is very much a global company and customer footprint day one. Uh, my sense is we'll probably double the number of employees in Europe this year. Uh, and we have a lot of new large-scale development projects uh, going on. Uh, we're putting a lot of extra resources into development. We just hired a very senior executive, one of the three vice president level development executives for the database out of Oracle, highest and most senior person ever to leave that group at Oracle. Uh, he's been there the last 20 years. He went there right out of MIT in 1984. He actually was the project manager for Oracle 7 and Oracle 8 and he just joined us in Redwood City to start a new development organization. So, you know, we, we really absolutely want to be a technology leader uh, and push the technology curve, so we're not going to lag behind there. Um, we've been extremely pleased with the quality of the executives we've hired uh, because I think this really is a talent game. You know, the better the talent you have, the, the better the chances that you're going to succeed. Uh, my chief technical officer also spent 14 years at Oracle. Uh, ran the mainframe group, started the Linux group, the unbreakable Linux program for Oracle in 2000, built that up, made it extremely successful. Um, so, you know, we, we have the management team that could probably today run a $500 million to a $1 billion company. Um, so we've, we've kind of laid that track and, you know, brought those people in. What's a, a big advantage is, we have a stock option program that we can give them a significant part of the company to join. Uh, and in this environment, you know, that's a very, very attractive uh, approach versus a startup is they have real products, customers, day one when they join. So, so giving stock options uh, with the new laws, with the new reg regular, this, the basically socks. Mm -hmm. uh, did it, did it impact your, the way you, you give away stock options to... to, to no, these are standard companies? options that will vest over a number of years. Uh, we're also a private company, so we have the advantage of not being under the requirements of, you know, disclosing our earnings every 90 days, and I think you can be much more in an investment mode in running the company and, and, and do things for the long term, at least right now, when you're a private company. Um, so we, we think that's a big advantage. Do you are you um, uh, aware of, of some of the the, the business um, uh, how business is done in France and 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 uh, perhaps uh, some of the uh, of course the tensions the the uh, I've been following it closely. Yeah. So 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 what what do you think? I mean, it's it's maybe it's, it's a bit an off question. It's more on, on, on France in particular. Yeah. Uh, th th does it worry you to do business in France? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, uh, I was born in London. Uh, my parents immigrated to the U.S. in the late fifties. Um, my wife is Australian, uh, who worked at Sybase and ran a lot of their development projects. Uh, she did a startup that we actually had a number of European investors. We had SAP. The first venture investment SAP ever made was in my wife's company. Uh, we moved to Munich for nine months to uh, start up the European headquarters and uh, lived there with our two young children. Uh, I spent last August, uh, we rented a house in, uh, in London. This year we're renting a house in Paris. So we're going to spend the month of August in Paris. Uh, I have a number of French uh, uh, business people that I know well. Leo Apotheker, who runs worldwide sales and is president of SAP in Paris. So I find, uh, you know, again, in particular, I find European customers are very value oriented and they value relationships and the trust that you have to build with them. So I, I find that. Um, that's an extremely attractive approach because that's kind of how we're going to run the business is we're here for the long term. And, um, you know, so I'm assuming I'm going to spend a lot of my time, you know, visiting customers like I did last month. I've been there, I think, three times in the last two months. So labor laws, regular, regulatory uh, um, rules, uh, many uh, around labor, labor laws, yeah. is not a concern for you? I don't think for what we're doing because I think that uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of 
uh, highly qualified software talent, in particular in France. Uh, um, and you look at Business Objects, which was started there, uh, and uh, you know IBM, Microsoft has their headquarters in Paris. I think those companies have done extremely well in Europe and in, Par in France in particular. Uh, and we, we have a very large customer base there, so I think it's extremely important that we build up the technical talent there to support them. Uh, and they've stayed loyal over this 10-year period with CA owning the product. So uh, again, I think it's very fundamental. I think as long as you deliver value and uh, you know you're very careful in the people you hire uh, and you treat them well, um, I don't think that'll be a problem for us. Well, what's going to be your good go to market strategy in those international markets? Are you going to go direct, or are you you're going to build a reseller? Is your channel? Yeah. Or are you going to go through uh, system integrators? Or it's, a, CA? It, 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 it's a combination. We have a reseller agreement with CA. There are certain situations. We have a number of large government contracts and government institutions, in particular, uh, a number in France, actually, uh, that require approval, and we need to have in the short run CABR reseller. Um, I think in the in the major countries, uh, UK, France, Germany, Italy, etc., Spain, we will have our own direct sales organization and support group and some development people as well. So we're going to staff those organizations that way. I think in the smaller environments, especially Eastern Europe, some of the Nordics, Middle East, we'll have a combination of resellers who we have today who uh, came across from the CA relationship. So. Um, I've met with a number of them in Europe already, and they're very gun ho I mean, the fact that this is very focused now, and it's going to get the investment dollars and all the rest, you know, they're very excited about. So I think it'll be a combination. When you um, hired uh, Tom uh, as a CFO, yes. it was, it was, it was a surprise at first. Uh, it was, well, Ch Charles Phillips, is, it was also a financial analyst at Oracle. So, was it sort of a me too type? Oh, they, they have Oracle has. Uh, I wouldn't. Tra has I wouldn't trade Tom for Chuck. So I like Chuck a lot. I've known both of them many, many years. Yeah. No, I. I, uh, I think if you look at Tom's background, Tom uh, spent ten years at Wells Fargo and at Deloitte uh, building applications. So he's extremely technical, uh, which many CFOs aren't. Uh, so he really cut his teeth on ten years of doing real hardcore development. Uh, both at Goldman Sachs and at Citigroup, he covered the industry, took Red Hat public, so he knows every CEO in the industry, which is very, very valuable. Uh, and, you know, I think in terms of the new business model, you know, he's had to model all these businesses. I think at Citigroup, he had 30 public companies, software companies that he covered, and he saw all the trials and tribulations of them changing their business models, going to subscription, thinking about open source. So what's very, very uh, attractive about Tom is he's very strategic. Uh, in, in the midst of doing all his research work, he talked to a lot of customers. He's very well known by all the CIOs around the world. Um, obviously, being at Goldman and Citigroup, these are global financial institutions. So, you know, he brings a perspective um, uh, at all levels uh, that I find very, very appealing. Uh, and I think that as the company grows, he's going to take on more and more responsibility for us. And that's more of a business development job, not really a CFO job. So, what, what really, why, why CFO? Well, no, I, I again, I think that he's watched all the changes with uh, all the Gap accounting, with Sarbanes-Oxley, with SOX. Uh, a big part of the CFO job is the systems you put in place. So I think making decisions on what our ERP system is going to be, what our financials are going to be. So if you look at the functions he has, it's legal, it's accounting, it's the CIO, uh, it's human resources. So, you know, across all those major areas, it's not just finance, even though he knows that very well. I think the other thing that's uh, fantastic about Tom is he's a leader. And very, very quickly, he's taken control and given direction to the group. And people like working for him. And so, uh, you know, I can hi he can hire a great controller and, you know, finance people to kind of make the trains run on time, but it's extremely hard to find someone that can kind of play that larger role. 
And so I view him as you know one of the top couple of people that I rely on in the management team. Right. You're, you're the CEO of, of Ingress. You're also um, um, uh, managing your, 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 your fund. Right. So how do you divide your time? You're sort of Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> that no, Steve is very unusual. I, uh, I don't know how he does it. Um, you know, this is a temporary role as CEO. I'm definitely looking for a permanent CEO. I've been in this role for four or five months. Uh, I've completely filled the management team. We're going to announce uh, a new head of Europe uh, in the near future. We just hired someone to run Asia for us. Uh, so I feel that, you know, in the last four or five months, I've been able to hand pick the executive team. And I've been looking for, you know, the right person to put in that can really run this to the next level. So my role will then be chairman. I'll be involved in the company. I'll probably spend about a quarter of my time on Ingress. Um, I'm also chairman of Wise Technologies in the thin client space and I'm very involved there. So I think part of it is I really enjoy this and I enjoy meeting customers and talking to people in the industry and recruiting. So um, you know, I've been able to fill in the gap in the short term, and I promised CA when we spun this out that I would, you know, carry the mantle for a while. Um, so, but it's not a long-term solution, and hopefully, I'll find someone in the near term to come on board. You, you said you you've talked to a lot of CIOs, CEOs in this industry. Uh, how do you see them? Uh, how, what's their feeling in the, in perhaps in the, in the economy? Do you see them spending a little bit more uh, money in IT? Yeah. In, in or or being more uh, conservative? How how sort of the, the mood? I think it's very positive right now, and I think that many companies have tightened up, and over the last few years have become ex much more better run than they were before. Uh, so they view IT spending really as a productivity enhancement, and it's got to pay back. I think the days of just spending money to, you know, race ahead or try something new has a little bit fallen by the wayside. But I think uh, every business is trying to deploy the internet in some capacity, whether it's commerce or content or whatever that may be, and so um, I think because businesses are much more global now. Communication systems uh, and um, you know productivity is still really important. So I, I see at least the same spending level as the last two years, if not going up, going forward. And as long as interest rates stay low and uh, you know the general economic climate is good, I mean there'll be some areas around the world that are weaker, but I think in general Japan looks like it's getting stronger. Um, I, th I think general spending globally will be will be good and the macro picture is pretty good as well just going back on on, on more on the product side ha have you have you seen that that ingress uh, have uh, uh, created that uh, that community have have attracted open source developers to to basically help in the development um, and and, and uh, yeah. improve the product or because there's always this this issue by taking something that was closed source to open source and, and try to create artificially that, that community then from taking the like a MySQL was from the ground up was was open source. Yeah. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of different ways to do this. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you look at the Red Hat example, which you know has become kind of a mission critical technology that major banks and insurance companies and telecom companies are using. You know, it's, it, it's thought of in that vein. That didn't get there. Red Hat didn't get there by individual developers in this community enhancing the product. What actually happened was, uh, and Dave Dargo, who's my CTO, was very involved in this, is Oracle took Red Hat and they put all the mission critical features in. And part of that was that Oracle had a lot of experience porting all their applications and database to you know, dozens of operating systems. So they really know a lot about operating systems. Again, I think that what I call this business open source model is that you have to be very sophisticated to add the kind of features we're looking for. And so I'll give you an example. In the mid-90s, the way Sybase built a product called Replication Server, uh, which was used by a lot of the major banks for their global trading systems. They went to four major customers, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, and two others, and they said, we want you to help collaborate and help us design the product 
for global trading between Tokyo, London, New York. It had to be done on a real-time basis. You could never lose a transaction. Over an 18-month period, those banks designed the product collaboratively with Sybase. Sybase coded it. They got the product for a very, very cheap price at the end of that. But then Sybase productized it and took that out to all their other thousands of customers. That's what I envision is one of the things that on Wall Street today that's very important is time stamping of data. So how long do you keep an email? How long do you keep a voicemail? In this highly regulatory environment, you have to be able to actually cue the data and know that you're going to archive it for certain lengths of time. That is not something an individual open source developer uh, is going to help you with. You really have to have the knowledge base of one of those large institutions to do that. So our approach is going to be much more to proactively look for areas to add that kind of capability and go out and pick a few of those customers. Maybe it's um, um, you know a major integrator uh, in Europe or in Asia that will help with that, that does application development for them. So I, I guess we're not looking for an army of individual programmers who are going to help with this task. And in fact, it's a bit of a fallacy when you really peel the onion back and you talk to people who support a lot of the other open source products. It's typically handfuls of people that really, you know, are really actively actually putting code into the product. So where where do you see the benefit of, of, of open source then if it's not by having this this uh, hundreds of the free developers working for you? You know, the problem with the closed source players today is you really have to lobby them to put features in. So it's called closed source because even if you're a sophisticated, you know, major bank or insurance company, there's no guarantee you're going to get your features in. So I think we're envisioning something that's much more collaborative, uh, and we're defining that process right now. Is you know, at the end of the day, we're going to still own the technology, but um, you know, we're going to be much more receptive to additions coming from those people. So again, I think open source will bifurcate into a number of buckets. There will be some things that are kind of a catch-all, you know, totally open-ended. Um, it's just like political systems. I think there'll be a purist communist system, there'll be a complete capitalist system, and there'll be a lot of gray in the middle, and I think we're going to be maybe somewhere in between. Are you, are you outsourcing some of the development that you're doing here um, and, and to where? To now, today, uh, the development is done in, uh, partly in London, in the development center there, partly in Long Island, where CA's headquarters. We have a team of people there. Now we're putting a new team here in Redwood Shores. Um, you know, this is really where there's a large, sophisticated community of, of developers. Um, the other thing that's interesting is if you look at the people who really touch, for example, the Oracle kernel of the database, there's probably only a few dozen people. There may be thousands of programmers at Oracle, but the people who really touch the kernel are only a few dozen people. And those people have been there forever, like the person I recruited after 20 years. So it's really not a game of putting armies of people or having another thousand developers in India to do this task. It's probably I need to hire 10 or 15 crack programmers in Redwood City who have done this before. Um, so it's a little counterintuitive that way. Having your headquarters at Redwood Shores, was it uh, just uh, just to make it easier for ex-Oracle people to cross the, the border? Uh, well, I think partly I live here, uh, so it, it partly relates to that. But th yeah, this is where a lot of the talent is, although... Uh, you could have chosen to be in Palo Alto, in Santa Clara, but you chose Redwood Shores. We actually looked at the old 20 Davis Oracle building to go into, but it was rented, so that would have been a little bit too close to home. I will say we have much more of a virtual team. Jim Finn, who runs corporate communications, works out of New York. My head of worldwide sales is on the East Coast in uh, Maryland. Um, so, I, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's a focal point here in Redwood City for what we're doing, but, um, you know, I think as we see great people, whether they're here or overseas or wherever, we're hiring them. Um, and I think that's one of the advantages of being small, uh, that you know, we can still, you know, today you have email and you have a lot of tools that you know, allow you to kind of put people in the very, you know, wherever that makes sense for them and, and manage them that way. 
Though, so having a vir this, this virtual organization is not an impediment for you. It's it's on the, on the opposite side. Something that that you value. Um, I, I think you've got to work harder to make sure everybody you know works together, but. Many of these people have worked together in the past, so there's a long history, which I think is an advantage. Um, we hired the head of product management out of Red Hat. She lives in North Carolina. Uh, so again, being able to take somebody of that talent and that experience, I wouldn't want to pass on that because I can't pick them up and move them to Redwood Shores. So, um, you know, we've, we've taken probably more risk in going that path. What do you think of, is, is is Larry Ellison thinking about what you're doing with uh, with Ingress? I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Uh, you know, I think uh, we are attacking a particular part of his business, and if we're extremely successful, we'll still be a relatively small part relative to him. I mean, Larry's built an incredible fifteen billion dollar a year business. I mean, he stated plans to get to thirty. Um, you know, we're we're going to be a couple hundred million dollars. You know, hopefully successfully. So and maybe I'd be acquired by Oracle one day. I doubt we'll be acquired by Oracle. Maybe other people who would love to own a database, but I doubt it'll be Oracle. Although but, they, they, they were, were rumors that they wanted to acquire MySQL, and which is more or less. In yeah, I would never rule anything out. Um, I. Uh, I think he has a lot of other challenges. He spent $18 billion on applications, and you know I think he's going to have a lot of his work tied up to that here in the near, near future. What, what's, what's your exit strategy? You know, the way we approach this is we're looking to build great companies, and we have very patient investors. We have a 10-year fund. The life of this fund is 10 years. Um, the Stanford and Harvard Endowment, who I mentioned, is half of our capital. Uh, we have a, a handful of investors in Europe, Alpinvest, the Dutch Pension Fund is a large part of our fund. I don't think they're motivated by any type of quick flip or, you know, we need our exit in a short period of time. So our directive has been to build great companies. And if it takes three or four years or it takes seven or eight years, you know, that's the horizon that we're interested in. And I, I think we've got a great platform here uh, that, you know, we can build out over a long period of time. Um, depending on, uh, you know, the capital markets and our growth, you know, there's definitely a plan that, you know, if we get to the right size, we would go public. Um, and, you know, as far as mergers, uh, you know, if, if an offer came along where, you know, the two companies together are better than being one separate, you know, we would, we would absolutely consider that. So I don't think we're dogmatic about any any particular path. As a venture capital capitalist, what are the areas that you focus on? What are the companies and maybe the sectors? Yeah. Any enterprise software or you listen to a so range of companies? Both my partner and I were in the venture world for you know seven or eight years and were very successful in the mid to late 90s, early 2000 um, with a string of companies in these various sectors. However, I think it's extremely hard to build an enterprise software hardware company from scratch today. Um, partly because, uh, you know, there are many alternatives in the market. Uh, and I think also the incumbents move much quicker. So if there's a new networking space, Cisco is constantly scanning the market to see what those new spaces are. And there may be a few dozen startups that get created they'll quickly jump in in the early stage and buy one and put it in their sales group and start selling it. So, you know, I started at Tandem in the late 70s. Tandem had a run for probably five to almost 10 years before IBM and the bigger companies really said, well, nonstop computing is a, a new market and we ought to do something. Today, I think it's literally months before the incumbents say, well, we've got to have a, you know, a play there, either build it, buy it, you know, do something. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity in the internet, and because the barriers to entry are lower to get customers. Those web 2.0 companies. Yeah, I mean the example I give is when Ariba was started in the late seven, late 90s. Their first customer, Chevron, spent five million dollars with them. Their first customer. I would say today, if you had a you know a remarkable new application, the customer may spend fifty thousand in the first year to pilot, and if you do really well, kind of grow it from there. So I think that's one thing that's changed is the 
the kind of uh, paranoia that drove big companies to spend a lot of money so they wouldn't be left behind has become more rational. And that's made it tougher for startups to string together enough deals to get to 5 million or 10 million or 20 million in revenue. Um, and that's partly why we've adapted this model where, you know, day one we've got, you know, a complete portfolio of customers and, uh, you know, technology and people uh, to get a running start to try and do this. Um, so I think it's going to be very challenging for startups, at least in the enterprise space going forward. How, how many business plans do you receive per, per day, per year? We're very unusual in that uh, what we talk to is prospective CEOs. And the way we analyze the market is there are 175 companies in the world that are what I would call technology companies with more than five billion of revenue a year. And so a CA or a Nortel or ones that we've worked with fit that profile. We try and figure out what they have in their portfolio, Ericsson, Alcatel, whatever it may be, that would be better served in a satellite operation where they could own a part but let us run with it like a startup. And so we're much more proactive to go talk to those companies and propose ideas uh, and say, what if you did this? What if you know, we used this plan or brought this executive in or whatever? So it's a, it's a little bit more of an outbound process than in the classic venture world, 20 companies come to you a week and show you their plan and they need to raise money and you, you, know, you kind of quickly decide whether that one's a good one or this one's a bad one. Uh, this is much more... We only do a couple of these if most a year. And when we do get involved, like I am here, I'm CEO, uh, I don't do anything but this. And so I think it's more like building Ferraris than it is building, you know, company, you know, Fords off the assembly line. And, and who, who would be some of the, the other venture f funds that are doing similar, like that, that what you do? Is it the Simden, the, the Apex? We, we see a lot of. Yeah. A lot of uh, First, a lot of big funds that are buying out right. some of the uh, yeah. uh, spin-offs. Spin I think what's unusual for us is we take much more operating risk than financial risk. So, you know, we're not going to put a lot of debt on the company. We're not going to leverage it. We're not looking to do a lot of financial engineering. You know, our goal is can we take a company with $50 million of revenue and grow it to 200 The other issue is um, when it's coming out, many times there's no management team so we have to put the management team in um, in the ingress case there was a head of development and that's all and so all the rest of the other functions we had to put 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 together um, the other issue is we're very comfortable if the business is losing money or not profitable which most buyouts people are looking for you know a lot of cash flow so they can borrow and that's kind of how they financially engineer it um, there's a couple of, I, I think there's a handful of venture groups that opportunistically look at these deals. Um, clearly, Silver Lake has built a brand for technology buyouts. and But again, they're at a much different layer doing multi-billion dollar, uh, typically taking public companies and going private with the existing management team. So I think we're a little unique. We call this a venture buyout. It's a buyout in structure, but it's a venture deal in that you know, we've got to grow the company like a startup, um, so it's kind of a little of both. So um, I think individual groups have done one-offs, but I'm not sure there's anyone else that this is all they do 100% of their time. What are the other companies you are involved right now? Wise is, is it one thing that... Wise is the thin client company that uh, we actually partnered with the Ku's family in Taiwan, one of the wealthiest families in Taiwan. Uh, Silicon Valley company that had been around since the early 70s went public in the US, went private, went public in Taiwan, went private, and we got involved with the family and uh, brought in a new management team. Uh, actually, uh, John Kish, who ran the desktop group at Oracle for eight years, uh, someone I'd worked a lot with, brought came in as CEO. Uh, we just spun out the Blade Server group out of Nortel. Uh, this is the product that both IBM and Hewlett Packard OEM and resell. Uh, so this is a direct effort against Cisco uh, to sell against them. Uh, and so again, 
Nortel spent a year evaluating this and decided to spin it out with us and keep a part of it. So, um, you know, our plan is to do a few more like this and then we'll probably raise another fund to do more of it. Just the last word, Lucent and Alcatel, that's probably a, yeah. an opportunity for you to... We've talked to both over time about different parts of their business. Uh, I think that the whole networking space is r you know, rampant with rumors of Ericsson buying Juniper. or So I think it's very dynamic. I think the, the curious thing is that I think is the number of carrier shrinks. Uh, and you have a lot of mergers there, then that means the number of suppliers to them needs to shrink. And scale is very important here. So to some extent, this piece out of Nortel was really a business that was more in the computer arena with the Blade server uh, that just was a sore thumb that didn't fit for them, and that's why it made sense for us. But we're absolutely talking to a lot of those players. I think uh, you know Siemens is another major player with a lot of assets that... Uh, you know, probably would be a great group we'd love to work with. Um, and, um, you know, part of it is you've got to get, many of these companies, just for what it's worth, have done a lot of acquisitions. Uh, CA, for example, buys another public company every quarter. They had never really done a divestiture before. So a bit of our mission is to explain and work with the CEOs and the boards to explain why why you would ever divest something and keep a stake uh, to make it more successful uh, because they're absolutely much more accustomed to we're going to buy something to grow our revenue so it's a little bit in a different direction but I think you know we're finding that um, in this environment where people are trying to rationalize the business and figure out what their real strengths are you know we can be a very good ally to, to help them with that. So basically you have very long days we have very long days. What time do you start in the morning? Uh, well, my three young children get me up at around six. Um, the toughest part is the travel because uh, unlike startups where the entrepreneurs come to you and come to Sand Hill Road and you know your meetings are all here, uh, half of my time is spent out in the road visiting customers. I mean, if, if I'm trying to convince Siemens to sell a business in Dallas, I've got to go to Munich or Alcatel, the decision's going to be made you know, in Paris. So you've got to go and spend a lot of time with those executives. So uh, our business is much more, much more heavy travel out to visit the companies than, than you do in the venture world. And you cannot use video conferencing or anything. It's not the same. Have people to people. Absolutely. I mean, if they're going to turn over 10,000 of their customers to you, they want to make sure you're not going to do anything bad with it. And they want to see you eyeball to eyeball and know that you know they can trust you with this. So, yeah, it comes with the territory. Right. Thank you. Thank Has you that been helpful? Oh yeah. yeah good. Definitely. Good. Okay.